with us uh, today. Um, I, I must say I'm, I'm very proud that uh, Vlad uh, managed to have the, this, this panel with us today because we, we have a lot of questions, myself and the, in the audience, about uh, the, uh, the funding in, in general. But for, for start, uh, could you take one minute to present yourself? Because we have a, a, a panel of formal engin uh, former engineers. We, we all started as engineers. And uh, if you could explain how to move up from engineering to... Uh, <laughs> Just me, OK. Uh, I need uh, to explain that one a bit, yeah. <laughs> so I bought mine. Can... There is no explanation for that. Um, so I, I did start as an engineer. My name is John Soberg. I'm a partner at a fund in Silicon Valley called uh, Expansive Ventures. Um, and probably the most unique thing about us is that we actually have a global footprint, and so we do invest outside of the U.S., which is a little unique for, uh, for a fund of my size. Um, I'm, I'm definitely not an engineer. Um, I'm going to get hissed off the uh, stage now. I, I'm an accountant. That sounds like a like start of Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> um, and I've been trying to run away from it ever since. So... <laughs> I jumped ship in 2000 to whatever the opposite of the dark side is. Um, to the, what, the well, right. I don't know. The right side. Uh, I've been working with startups for the last 15 years, trying to blag my way as someone who sort of understands technical issues, but really doesn't. Okay, John's underselling himself there. He basically has <laughs> started the whole boom in London when it comes to startups, thanks to John, frankly. Uh, so yes, you're right. I am. I, I did. Uh, I did mechanical engineering. Although I was actually, as a kid, I was a was a software programmer. And when I was doing mechanical engineering, kind of realised that I really didn't want to drive over a bridge that I had designed. And so <laughs> that would have been fairly fatal. So I, I decided that programming Which was better. Which bridges did you design? <laughs> uh, yeah. <clears throat> yes, there was. Uh, one in India somewhere. No, um, <laughs> it was the only place that let me work. Um, but um, yeah, so but I started as a as a programmer and then ended up uh, long journey to starting my own fund, exactly like John. So we have a, a an international global fund called Spark Labs, which is um, partners are basically San Francisco, Seoul, Singapore, Tel Aviv, and London. And then I also have an investment here in Cluj, which just launched a few weeks ago, called Mime Chat. And yeah, mind chat. <laughs> uh, and I think Cluj is uh, is fantastic. I talk about Cluj to everyone. I think it's a it's a proper center of uh, excellence for for software in um, in Europe. You know, what's the there's a great website in Cluj called the best city in the world, which I I, I always found is uh, most amusing, but very cool. And I'm Maris Gena. I'm a serial entrepreneur and business angel based in Bucharest, Romania. Also working with um, Venture Capital Investments, uh, together with three key capital partners, we are operating uh, two funds, two VC funds in the region. One is a specific VC fund for Romania. Uh, it's called Catalyst Romania. Probably the only one of a kind for tech investments at this level in Romania, half a million to 1.5 million euro per project. And uh, that's also backed by uh, Jeremy Funds, EIF. And the other fund, a larger fund, uh, 100 million plus fund, uh, TCE Fund 3 of 3TS, uh, uh, which is a fund operating throughout the region, so anywhere from Vienna to Istanbul and, uh, say, um, Warsaw and the Baltics to, to Sofia and, uh, and Greece. Oh, strike Greece. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I would get back to you too now because you know a little bit Romania. You already invested in Romania. Uh, uh, what, what you would you say to to uh, to the to one investor that uh, didn't come yet to Romania? Uh, do you think that the, the Romania is the new or the Eastern Europe is the new new Eldorado for the for the investors? Or uh I guess uh, if I if I may start as knowing a bit more about Romania probably than my my colleagues here, my panel colleagues. Um, of course, it is. Um, um, a place where one can find a lot of opportunities for investment, especially in the in the tech sector. Uh, then again, you know, to call it an Eldorado, uh, it's, it's utopia, and uh, it's not like that. It doesn't work like that. 
one of the advantages and uh, at the same time challenges of Romania, I think, is that as opposed to other countries in the region, like you know Bulgaria or, or Moldova or Hungary, uh, in Romania you have actually a number of, of, of towns where you have you know vibrant tech activities. So in order to get you know the best of Romania's tech. Uh, potential investments, you need to go to all these places. So it's not only about Bucharest, it's not only about Cluj. These would be, in my opinion as well, the first two, let's say, major hubs. But then you have Timisoara, you have Yash, you have a bit of activity in, in, in towns like Orada, Sibiu, Brasov, and you even have, you know, um, activities in other, other towns of Romania. So if you want to, you know, scour everything, you need to go to all these places as opposed to, you know, going just to Sofia or just to Chisinau or just to Budapest, and then you, you, you get the, the, whole, the whole country in just one fell soup or in, in, in one visit. So I guess that's, that's one of the challenges of Romania. The other challenge for Romania is that um, a lot of the tech companies are still not aware of the advantages of, of getting investments and, and, and breaking the, you know, the bootstrapping barrier, uh, as opposed to other, other countries, even in the region, where I see that people are more, entrepreneurs are more keen on, on you know, finding investments at, at an early stage, rather than waiting for, for later stage that might not, you know, m they might not get there at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've got a kind of a different opinion. <laughs> so, um, you know, I invested beforehand. I've invested in, you know, obviously in Silicon Valley a lot, but, but, um, but also in Israel, in, in Sweden, in Korea, and um, particularly. And, and I, I quite like um, small countries with a very highly educated population that wants to work very hard and get out and has to sell out. Uh, and in the rest of Europe, I mean, you know, Germany and France and Italy and that, I'm not that interested because they've got very big markets and, and there isn't a dynamic as much as there is for smaller countries. I mean, Estonia and, and Tallinn, and, you know, is another great example of that. And so, and I think that actually here in Romania, it's probably going to, in every place, it always clusters around one central location. It always does. Um, and that I think that's going to be... Well, I'm putting a bet on Cluj because I think of the university town and the very highly educated population and, and a very strong um, bet here in terms of, of people here. But it generally does coalesce around one team. But I also think that unfortunately at this stage it, there isn't enough investment in Eastern Europe from a seed stage capital viewpoint. People don't really, seed stage investors aren't really investing in, in down here and I particularly like here. Um, so I would more encourage people probably to bootstrap, get the product out there, get it working, and then you know look at whether you know London or the U.S. or you know move as you know move as early as possible. Unfortunately, at this stage, to to figure out how to do that. But I think that that's probably the way it's going to have to happen initially. Okay. So I have a question for you too now. Uh, for the audience, uh, what would be the, the three key factors that you look when some, some, someone is pitching you? So for me, the most important thing is always the team. Um, the, the quality of the team is by far the number one thing. So you get some of that with the pitch, but it's less about the pitch than just the interaction with the people and learning about the people can, and their skills. Can you explain a little bit what do you, do you understand by the quality of the team? Because this is quite abstract for, for, for them. <laughs> So when I typically invest in companies, uh, call in fintech companies, mm -hmm. in financial yep. technologies. So for me, I look for usually somebody who understands that market and has been working in that market for a long time. So not so particularly for tech? Uh, well, that for yeah, first yeah. and foremost, I need yeah, somebody yeah. who understands the market. I also do look for tech. I, I would, s and then I often look for marketing or the ability to acquire customers. It depends a little bit on what they're trying to do, but what I would tell you is that I will not invest in a company that has critical gaps in the team. So if you're building a technology product and your CTO is, n is not a, one of the top CTOs, I can't make that investment. So it's about, when I talk about the quality of the team, if you build a product in a certain market and you don't have expertise in that product and market that's better than others, then that's gonna mean that I won't invest in that. The, you asked for three, so the second one I look for is the market itself. 
So how big is the opportunity that you're going after? Is this something that you're only going to be able to sell in Cluj or Romania? Or is this something that's going to be able to go global? Um, and then often, uh, to, the, to the point on bootstrapping, I like to look at what are, what's the data so far? So what have you done with the resources that you've had to date? That tells me a lot about how the team is going to actually be able to build going forward. I'm, I'm going to say the same things. Um, I, I think the one thing I would say to the people in the room is you'll find lots of questions that are asked, whether they're talking about how's your product, what's your sales, what's your status, what's the market. But actually, what the investor is actually asking are actually signals towards the team. So they're actually saying, have you got a product? I.e., is this a team that builds stuff? Have you got any sales? It's actually not about sales themselves. It's do you have someone that can actually have the capacity to sell inside your team? Actually, when you're talking about market, you're trying to understand how's the person thinking about, how's he addressing the market? And it's also constantly going back to the team. So don't mistake all of these other questions for actually questions about these things they're all indicators back to, is this a really smart team? Are they thinking really smart? Is this someone that actually I want to go on a journey with for the next five years? OK, thank you. In, in regards with that, uh, I mean, OK, let's assume we have a great team. We have the funding to, to start. What do you think that, because you, you moved around the, all over the, the globe, what will be the best shots that we will have in Romania? I, I personally, I see two tech that you can go get global very fast, and the other one uh, build local, addressing the, 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 the local market with on different businesses. I mean, what, what's your opinion on, on this one? I guess if we are talking about technology in general, it's also a question whether you, you, you build something necessarily for the global market, or you can find uh, a different type of address, like maybe a regional play mm -hmm. might make sense for a future exit. Uh, take fin FinTech for an example. It's, it's rather difficult to develop a lot of these models globally, really yeah. go globally. We are looking, right now, we are looking at a few projects that are really meant for Romania that could probably scale a bit more in the region, and then that would be, you know, the end of it, and, and, and we would be looking for, for an exit to a, to a really global player. And I think that's a, that's a good plan, uh, and, and that's something that we would encourage. So in between global and, and, and local, there is always a more of a regional approach, and I think that, that works, or that could work particularly well in the Romanian context, because you have a, few, a few countries in the region, well, you have a few... <laughs> Lunch is good. Maybe you can... You can <laughs> Maybe you can mute your microphones <laughs> just to be on the safe side. Okay, so, so basically there is something in between global and local, and, and in Romania's case in particular, you can actually expand some of these model, models, even tech models, you can expand them to, to, to a regional, like uh, technology, and sometimes if you're talking about tech-enabled businesses like e-commerce, for instance, we're also investing in e-commerce. I know that you know it sounds rather trivial for, for most of your people, but we also invest in e-commerce, and e-commerce, it's very difficult to scale it globally, you know, from day yeah. one. You go country by country, and then if you, if you are good enough, and if you are strong enough, Romania is a good basis because 20 plus million people, good consumer market, good trends for the e-commerce, and then you can probably land in, in Bulgaria, Hungary, uh, Czech, Slovak, former Yugoslav countries, maybe some other countries in the region, and you, you create such a regional play that will make sense for, for a global uh, strategic uh, investor, let's say, in a, in a few years now, time. Okay, I totally agree with that. I mean, you know, we, we invest quite a lot in Southeast Asia in e-commerce because it's really early. We don't do e-commerce in Europe, well, may, I mean, like, um, you know, UK in that because it's very, very saturated. But down here, I mean, there's huge amounts of opportunities, same as in Southeast Asia, for early stage regional plays in e-commerce. So. Uh, you know, I think that's really interesting. You know, taking advantage of the scale, building up a strong brand that goes across the region, understands the, the intricacies of the market, and that understands also that each market is very, very different, as in Southeast Asia. It's not just one lump, which kind of people tend to think about, from Europe, from, particularly from the US, about Eastern Europe. It's like that sort of strip thingy, that, you know, so they haven't really kind of figured out there's a few countries along the way. Um, and uh, so, I think that's, that's about right. But I, I, I do think as well that there is a, 
a, um, a good opportunity for strong Eastern European talent. The one thing that, you know, in US and London is that there is a strong recognition that there's an exceptionally good technical talent here. Um, that's probably not backed up yet with strong understanding around business, marketing, et cetera, that, but there's a very good technical talent. And so everybody knows that. So I think the opportunity, if you can find a good partnership with some business and, and marketing people and then take that overseas, investors will like the fact you're from Eastern Europe because they'll understand it's technical. It's not just some business play. It's, it, you know, there's a strong technical element to it. And that's what I would play up when I'm coming from Eastern Europe. I'd say that that's what I've got as, a, my, as my core thing, my home run, is my technical talent that I'm, I can bring to the play here. Can I go off in a different direction? Yeah. Yeah. I think there's an elephant in the room, and it's called outsourcing. I think it is potentially the biggest opportunity uh, because that's what's effectively developed the muscle, which is the technical talent. But it's actually going to be your hardest challenge because guess what? You can make a lot of money on outsourcing. And trying to wean yourself off that drug and actually move towards product-style businesses is going to be a massive challenge for this area. I, in, in a, on a micro level, I can see this with people in London today who are actually freelancing in the startup community and making a lot of short-term money. But actually, are those the people who have the capacity to jump ship and actually go and build a real business and real product? And I think regionally, I think that's the big question which sits today which is the competency, the technicality, the muscle which exists here is because of it, but can you shift as a, as a region away from it towards product? I'm just gonna quickly follow on that one because that's exactly what Halcyon did. So, you know, Halcyon, who's one of the sponsors here, you know, watch those guys, you know, go from a very, very small team with Levy and Savi <laughs> up to a very, very big team of like, you know, 32, 33 people doing amazing apps around the planet. And then they developed one, which they did internally, and now they've developed MimeChat, but they've done MimeChat in the app exactly the right way. It's a London company, it's brand new. You know, um, one of them's walking away to become the CEO uh, of the company, and you know, so the, others are, the other one's leaving to, to keep that as an outsourcing thing. I really absolutely agree. You know, agencies trying to just launch their own apps, I've seen that time and time again in the UK and the US, it never works. You've got to do it properly. It has to, otherwise, you know, it's got to be hived off, separate company, running properly as its own team, uh, which these guys are doing. That's the only reason I invested in it, because they're going to do it. But they're absolutely right. That's the way it's got to be done. Tom? So I would say I probably am the least familiar with the specifics of this market. I've invested quite a bit in Europe, but not, not in Eastern Europe yet. Um, so for me, I think the regional play is definitely, when I see e ecosystems around the world develop, they typically do develop local, regional, then global, um, because the skill sets to, to, to take a company global or even to take a company regional have to be developed over time. So I, you know, as it's been said, it's very clearly recognized that the talent, uh, the tech talent here is, is, you know, as good as anywhere in the world and can compete on the global stage. So realistically, it is about can you build a product then that you can build into a really interesting business. So, you know, building a product is one thing, but building a business is another, and it's the next step. So it's about figuring out the mix of talent between the business and the technology, but I agree, the tech has got to be the core, I think, is the starting point. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I mean, um, I personally have a company of 250 people, and we are trying to shift from outsourcing to products, and uh, the best way to do is to split up and do a new company and... Uh, I mean, we'll see if we will succeed on this because it's a real struggle. So we have uh, another two minutes, and afterwards we'll have ten minutes to 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 take questions from the audience, uh, which I think is great. To I I left the, this time to to have people asking you questions. Uh, I'm balancing between two questions. Uh, Florin and and Radu earlier talked about. Uh, uh, the Silicon Valley and the fact that if you want to really succeed and go global, you have to go at some point to, to, to the States. But uh, I kind of disagree with this. Yeah, I mean, we can build global companies here in Europe. Um, I, I, I think uh, there's something fundamentally different also happening, which is entrepreneurship and opportunities now exist on a global level. I think the days that you have to be in the Valley um, why it's, it is appropriate for certain businesses aren't, is not a carte blanche. 
Um, I mean, you are a living example. Everything you're, you're building actually is probably at the exclusion of the valley. Um, and, and it's because there are, s what is happening in the world today and the impact the internet has, as I described, behind screen and in front of screen, um, being either behind a laptop screen or a, a mobile or in front of it, which is internet of things, is fundamentally changing how we live as a society. And what that looks like in Asia or in Europe or anywhere else in the world isn't reliant upon 15 square miles in the west coast of the States. And by the way, the vast proportion of the planet actually live and breathe on Android, <laughs> not on iOS. So, That's an in-joke. <laughs> so let me, let me say a few things, because I get this question every single place that I go. Um, I, I, I think, well, first of all, let me start with the core premise of what I'm doing at Expansive Ventures is the fact that we believe that there are great companies all over the world. So it is not a limited you know, resource that, that is Silicon Valley or San Francisco as, as the shift seems to be happening, um, at least where I live. But I will say this, the, the, I think what people mistake a little bit is that if there is magic in Silicon Valley, and I don't know that there absolutely is, but the two ingredients that Silicon Valley has more than any place else in the world are capital and people who have built global companies. And so those skill sets exist there in, in a lot more supply than, it, than in other places. And so it is true that I think when companies want to raise huge rounds, they often go to the US. It doesn't mean that they have to, but I think it's a more common path. And often when you want to get expertise of people who have built a Facebook or have built a Google, those people are in Silicon Valley. So it's not to say that you have to go there. I think it's to say that if you're building a company that's trying to scale globally, it might be actually a good move to go there. So However, I was on the board of Spotify from the very early days. And, uh, and as we watched it three years, you know, Daniel looked at the US multiple times and decided at the end of the day Sweden was the best place because of what he did in terms of building it from a tech talent. Everyone who has best, and also because Sweden does have companies, does have skill sets about people who have built global companies, but, um, but now he, he has the best talent sucking up into Europe. And, and it was the same thing when I found DeepMind and invested on them with my previous VC firm because their actual, their thing was basically that when they pitched it, there was only 10 of them, was that we know we could do this in the US, um, but we think we can get really good talent here for half the price, and they're gonna be twice as loyal. And it's gonna take us a little longer because they've never done a startup before, so we have to take them through some interesting challenges and journeys on that way there. But we can do it, and, and they did. I don't think they could have scaled DeepMind as fast as they did if they'd done it in the Valley. So there are certain circumstances, but at the end of the day, capital is in the US, there's no question about it. But Asia is playing a lot. You know, the interesting thing with China is that the Chinese investors do not want to, VCs don't want to put any money in China right now. They want to get their money out of China as fast as possible and put it anywhere else. So, you know, there's big opportunities there. Russia is the mm -hmm. same. So, you know, I think the capital is changing as well from a model perspective. Yeah, if I may quickly add, I think there, there, there should be a, uh, an optimal route for each company and for each project. And not all these routes lead necessarily to, to Silicon Valley. They might lead elsewhere or they might keep the company here, here in Romania. Of course, capital is important. While you solve the equity problem already, if, and if you can solve it here, already a big part of the, uh, you know, of the, of the uh, um, attraction towards, towards places like Silicon Valley is vanishing. And then you still have the need of people that have the skill sets and, and have the ability to, to, glo uh, to grow global companies. And indeed, in some places around the world, it's easier to find that than, let's say, in, in Cluj or in Bucharest or anywhere in Romania. So that's the second problem that you are faced with. And, and when you get to that problem, I guess um, a good partner, a good investor can help you find those uh, people, and of course, those people might be located in London or or, or West Coast U.S. or or somewhere else. Some it could be Hong Kong or, or Shanghai for certain types of, of businesses, but but they probably need to be 
uh, closer to the market, obviously, and they probably need to be those people that, that have the abilities, the competencies to, to, to build global, global companies. And they don't, let's, let's face it, they don't necessarily have to be uh, Romanian managers. They can be, they can be managers, uh, U.S. managers or, or, you know, managers that, that you know, in like some cases you don't even know what kind of identities they have because they've lived in so many countries that they don't really, you know, call any country home. Okay, thank you. So we have uh, another two minutes to take questions from the audience quickly. We can wait a little longer. Let's get more questions. Hello. I actually have two questions. So the first one would be wh what are some of the areas where you flash, uh, identify? Flash your phone. Okay, just to, just to see where you are. I'm here. Hello. Okay. No, I mean with the light, with the, the screen. Okay. It's, it's, okay. Like an, it's like an interrogation here. So, what are some of the areas where you identified an opportunity for Ameri for uh, Romania uh, to have more startups, and why is that localized to, to Romania? And the second question is, uh, what are some of the companies where you had the opportunity to invest and you said no, and then you regretted it? afterwards. Uh, the and second one is more interesting. I mean, the first one we already tackled, I, I think, a little bit. The, the second one is quite interesting. So I'll give you, it's, it's called an anti-portfolio. If you look up on Google anti-portfolio, there are a few, star, uh, few investors who are willing to disclose what they've passed on. And I think Bessemer has a really good page on that. My best one I've, I've passed on was a business called, I'm sure you've heard of it, Buffer. So I know Joel personally, he's still a good friend of mine, even though mm -hmm. I passed on it. And the way he pitched it to me was, he said, imagine being able to tweet now, but in the future. That was it. <laughs> and now, in fairness, he was about three weeks old at that point. And technically today, that's still what he does. Uh, so yeah, that's the one I passed on. The one I passed uh, and regretted was, I'm not sure if Lerado is still in the room, Lerado Georgescu, uh, Romanian antivirus. That was uh, Rav. That was many, many years ago. It was the early 2000. And we were almost to, to close the deal. And then for some reason we didn't do it. And then he sold it to Microsoft for an undisclosed amount. But it was for sure a very good deal that I would have loved to, to take part in. Hopefully we'll, we'll make deals together uh, again as we are, you know. Yeah in the same, basically, uh, browsing and, and roaming in the same ecosystem of uh, um, Romanian tech uh, startups with, uh, with high potential. Uh, so the one that, when I was working for Horizon, so probably it's a bigger one, we passed on was when there were 40 people on um, Brandon, I think, called Twitter. Um, so <laughs> that was a small one. I mean, offset with the fact that I think only a few weeks earlier we'd put 140 million into Facebook. So. It was kind of balancing out there, actually, at the end of the day, but still. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, I think investors typically have a pretty, could have a pretty long list. And then, you know, partnership meetings are always interesting as well. So uh, um, I think the one I would point to that, that I had it was at my last fund was actually a, a company called uh, Indiegogo. That uh, I think maybe a few of you have heard of. So I saw them in their very, very first round. And at the time, all they were funding was independent films, which is where the name came from, in case you didn't know that. Um, so they were trying to f do Hollywood films that producers Girl in Hollywood would yeah. not do. And yeah. that was what they came and pitched, and we, we passed. Yeah, so essentially, it's a very good sign if we pass on your company. Um, <laughs> you know, you should be, you should go very, you should go big. Yeah, probably IPO. Okay, one, one more question. If Possible? Yeah, yes. one more question. Um, so my question is, um, I suspect that not all, uh, all investments are successful. So if you can um, say something like, uh, let's say 50% of my investments uh, were successful so far. That's uh, the first question. The second question is, what do you normally do when you decide to invest in a company to ensure that it succeeds? So what's your level of involvement? Do you have regular discussions with their management or get directly involved or hire someone to supervise or, well. Okay, second question. 
I might start because we're we're obviously investing at, at lower levels, and and I can say that when you invest as a small VC, and also I've been investing as a, as a business angel for for a long time, uh, there needs to be a. a, a a, a closer relationship with the investee company, uh, uh, certainly uh, uh, beyond the, the simple, you know, board participation. What does that entail? It really depends uh, on the on the company level, uh, you know, the, the the stage they are in, the the, the uh, how early or, or later stage they are as a company, how corporate governance work or does not yet work in the company. So depending on these things, you might get closer to the company or, or stay more and more towards the board level. But uh, we try to, to get involved as much as possible. And I think on that one, what really matters, in my opinion, is to have uh, people, to have with you people from, from the uh, investors team, people that really have some operational experience. Because the worst thing that could happen is you know, some consultant that haven't, hasn't done any business for his whole life comes and tells you how to do your business. So that's, and I've, I've, lived, I've lived through that as an entrepreneur, having investment funds together with me. And, and some of those investment funds, we actually got out and, and got new investment funds in just for the reason that they did not bring that kind of, you know, real <coughs> contribution that we were expecting. So the, we, we did get, a good get, thing. Get smart money in any way. Yeah, we, obviously what you're, you should be looking at as, as uh, uh, entrepreneurs at, as tech entrepreneurs with uh, financing needs is, is for, for the smart money with you know all the array of features that that smart money uh, that represent uh, well um, all six of us are founders uh, all partners we're all founders uh, so you know I think um, you know that's a pretty that's a very strong thing for a, a firm you know you can pick a team well when you've been there before I mean, do you, do you look for a, some certain level of chemistry on a personal level with the founders or not at all? Um, so uh, I'm at the other extreme. As part of Techstars, we spend 13 weeks with each of the teams. Um, th I have a personal view, which is if I'm stuck in a room for 13 weeks with someone, I've got to like them. Um, I don't care whether they're going to be Mark Zuckerberg and turn into um, Facebook. If you're a dickhead, you're not on my program. It's an arsehole-free zone. Um, but what ends up happening, and it's similar to these guys, which is I have a very close relationship with all of the founders uh, that participate in my program, and they will continue to pick up the phone um, two, three years later. So uh, I'm talking to someone who's just a, their Series B, because I'm independent of everybody else in the process. And so there is a trust between us, and we can actually have a proper conversation about what's the right thing for them to do. So I'll answer a little bit of the, uh, the other question as well. So I think all of us probably have a pretty similar approach in terms of when you start early, you realize you have to do what you can to try to help a company succeed. That said, um, you know, in terms of ratios, I think it's hard to say exactly what's, you know, what success means. Success means different things for different people. But at an early stage, you expect that some of your companies are not going to make it, no matter how good you are at this the odds are, are tough to build a, a business that gets a, a good successful exit. So even if people give it everything that they have, there will be some failures. And so you have to deal with that. And I think you have to deal with that as a founder and you have to deal with that as an investor. So I think the, you know, what you do is you just roll up your sleeves and you give the best shot that you can to every business that you invest in. And hopefully you, know, you get some that do really, really well. And the ones that don't do well, hopefully their next one does. The one thing I would probably say and this is important to think about, is what defines you as an investor is not just what your perceived successes are, but what your continuing relationship with the teams that don't work out are as well. Because when you actually have founders who have actually said, look, it didn't work out, but they're an invest they're, they're, as investors, they're amazing. To have that sort of relationship is really important because when you get those people in the Rolodex and that you work with them, you want them to come to you for the next deal as well, because you now know more about those people, how they work, what they are as, a, as individuals. So I actually think that it's not just, success is not just purely about financial, it's actually about how you work with people and the personal relationship you have with them. Thank you very much, and I hope we'll have you with us next year, announcing that you invest in a startup in, in Cluj. Okay. I've uh, just one little thing to say. So. 
um, together with Halcyon, we launched, a, we launched an app on Friday called SmartUp. It's, called, it's in the uh, iOS store. And Apple featured it over the weekend in 54 uh, home pages as best new apps. It's actually featured twice on the US homepage this morning in, in WWDC week. It's actually for you guys. It's, it's free, it's, it's a smart mentor, and it basically answers a lot of the questions you guys probably have. So just go download it now off the iOS store. Uh, if, you haven't, if you haven't got iOS, um, Apple has a really good recycling program for your Android phones. But no, 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 no. That's, 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 a, that's, a, great, that's a great plug that's a and Tim showing that like, if you want to get an investment, you need to be persistent. <laughs> yes. So even if we're about to kick you off stage, you're still doing a product plug. Absolutely. So that's a fantastic. So please chase those guys for investments. They have more we'll have money a, to spend. We we'll have a Q&A. Uh, yes, right now? No. Okay. okay, thank you very much, thank guys. You. Thank you. Thank you.